you've indicated uh, today and in the past that this bill would codify the law in 1973 in the landmark Supreme Court opinion of Roe v. Wade. Is that correct? Well, separate and apart, we are uh, in this bill would put into place a new uh, section of New York State public health law. Okay. It mirrors uh, some of the um, provisions that uh, were part of the Roe v. Wade decision, but it does other things. Okay. Um, it's, it's my opinion and, and, and belief, based on my review of the statute and the law, that this proposed piece of legislation does not, in fact, follow Roe. It do, does not, in, in fact, follow any of the Roe progenary. It doesn't follow Casey. It doesn't follow Carhartt. And it doesn't follow the Hellerstadt opinion. And I'm going to give you an example, and I'd like you to let me know um, how this statute squares with Roe. For instance, Roe indicates that a physician should be the individual that performs the abortion. And in fact, in Roe it says that the state may define the term physician as it has been employed in the preceding paragraph of this opinion to mean only a physician currently licensed by the state. Now, as, you, as we have discussed in the past, at the point of viability, the law currently requires two physicians to be present uh, at the abortion, correct? The current status of the law. No. At the point of viability. No. No, I, I'm and not sure. Is, is that? At the time. Um, I think what you're referring to are uh, issues that uh, have changed in the, you know, 47 years since. With, I'm talking about Roe versus Wade. And right. in Roe, there's a requirement of two physicians being present post-viability. Pre-viability, there's a requirement of one physician, and that's in the text on page 145 of the decision, uh, which was decided in 1973. Um, in, in this proposed piece of legislation, there is a there's a reference to Title VIII of the education law, as my colleague has recently uh, brought up. Now, how do you square the requirement of a physician or more than one physician in row uh, with this piece of legislation? How do you square it? Well, I think I started off saying that while it followed some, it was a separate piece of legislation that intended to put in our 2018 public health law, as opposed to our 1970 or 1973 understanding, that we would, in fact, uh, put in public health law today not just a physician, because in 1973, we did not have advanced practice clinicians that we have today. So I'm not sure. Uh, why um, we would continue to suggest that the only way, uh, you know, in 1973, I'm not even sure we had uh, stents available, but we certainly didn't, if they existed, they weren't done on an outpatient basis as they are done today. So in 2018, we are trying to look at where we are and where we are headed in medical practice, and the reality is that uh, in 1970, it is true, the only medical professional in the state of New York who was authorized to perform an abortion was a physician. We have recognized that that is out of date, and therefore, we are suggesting that going forward in 2018, 50 years later, we are going to have uh, medical professionals within their legal scope uh, uh, be able to provide the kind of 
uh, reproductive health services for which they have been trained. What if I were to tell you that even if this, even if this bill were passed, that it would be wholly ineffective without further action by the legislature. Would you agree to that? No. Okay, well, let me give you an example as to why I, I believe that. Um, under Title VIII, uh, midwifery is one of the professions. Is that correct? Um, midwifery, yes. Yes. T tomato, tomato, I guess you pronounce it a different way than I do. Um, well, I think the midwives let me, do as well. Let, well, that's okay. <laughs> let, me, let me give you an example because I want to stick to substance and not, you know, and not smoke and mirrors. So let's talk about the substance here. So no the smoking practice, in public buildings. The practice of midwifery, okay? Um, the practice of the profession of midwifery or midwifery is, is defined as the management of normal pregnancies, childbirth, and postpartum care as well as primary preventive reproductive health care of essentially healthy women, and shall include newborn evaluation, resuscitation, and referral for, in for infants. Okay, a midwife shall have a collaborative relationship with a licensed physician. Is that correct? Did we not change the um, licensed physician, the um, collaborative? Did we just change that collaborative? Yeah. Um, one, I think we may have made some adjustments on the collaborative agreement with physicians, but I think I said before, they are licensed to prescribe. And when I indicated that as, va as advanced practice clinicians, they were authorized to do medical abortions, not surgical abortions, that is a prescription. Understood, but that is, is that within the scope? It is within their scope to uh, prescribe appropriate uh, medications for uh, women uh, who are of reproductive age. Uh, is and it isn't that inaccurate, though, because the statute goes to so. say, the statute says the management, the management of normal pregnancies, and that envisions bringing the pregnancy to term. Uh, childbirth, okay, coming to fruition, the birth, postpartum care after the child is, is born, uh, and primary preventive reproductive health care. That is the scope of practice of a midwife. And the prescription of a drug that would cause an abortion seems to be outside of that scope. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't no, I you, do not agree. You, do you not believe that there would need to be further action by the legislature to broaden the scope of what it means to be a midwife so that they would then be able to prescribe a drug that would allow uh, for an abortion? No, I don't agree. Okay. Well, I disagree with you on, on the law as far as that is concerned, as we can clearly see. Uh, but I, I think that there, you know, let me just say one thing. Uh, sometimes those medications are also used to induce labor. So the notion that um, we as legislators try to superimpose our understanding of medical practice is why these debates go um, far afield. The reality is that um, the people may choose to go to um, uh, an obstetrician, but many women choose to go to a midwife, and there may be reasons that a seemingly healthy pregnancy is no longer a healthy pregnancy, and that is why we leave this to the province of medical professionals. But doesn't that speak to the intent of the prescriber? If it is the intent of the prescriber to use one of these drugs for an abortion, then theoretically there would be a different dose or a different way of using the drug. And you seem to have conflated those two. Is that correct? No. Okay. Well, I guess everyone can decide for themselves. Uh, I want to look at, at uh, Public Health Law 4164A. 
um, abortions after the 20th week of pregnancy. Um, it is in that section where the requirement lies that a second physician shall be in attendance to take control of and to provide immediate medical care for any resulting live birth. Uh, how does removing this statute enhance a woman's health? There, you know, isn't it better to have a physician present for a woman than not a physician who has certainly much more knowledge and expertise? Well, you, the fallacy in your argument is that after there was a federal partial birth abortion ban, there are no live births. I'm asking you specifically with respect to Public Health Law 4164A, and it clearly states that after the 20th week of pregnancy, that a second physician shall be in attendance. I'm asking you very clearly, how would that make a woman more healthy or more safe? How would that promote woman's health? Wouldn't it be better for a woman, for her health, to have a physician with infinitely more knowledge present at the time of that abortion after the 20th week? Uh, I will simply say to you that that is, uh, n for many people, not. Maybe um, for people you might know, that would make them more comfortable. The reality is that people are perfectly comfortable with the medical professional in whom they have placed their trust. That may be a nurse practitioner. That may be uh, a midwife. And these individuals will be operating within their l scope of practice, and people make choices. They, you know, quite frankly, there probably have been a number of people who have related to me over the course of my many years here uh, the, uh, the fact that they have received a, an abortion. None of them have ever said to me that they wished that I had been there. So our attempt to superimpose our understanding or our beliefs or our judgment for medical professionals uh, and the choice that individuals make about which professional they choose to uh, place their trust in uh, is divergent from in your view and mine. Well, well I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm glad that you said that. Um, what's interesting is that there's also a, a third party, if you will, uh, here, and that happens to be the state. Um, and if you have read and if you understand the rule in the Casey decision, if you read and understood the rule in the Carhartt decision, we talk about undue burden and undue burden is clarified in Carhartt and then it's actually used for the first time in a real test in Hellerstadt. Now, the undue burden test has to do with the state's legitimate interest. So do you not believe that the state has a legitimate interest in its perspective or potential citizen who's not yet alive. What's your question? I wish I could have someone read it back. <laughs> do, do you believe or do you not believe that the state has a legitimate interest in the prospective, in the prospective life of a citizen that's not yet in being? Pursuant to the current status of the law, which is that a life is a life at birth. So does the state not have a legitimate interest in that potential human being? Well, you know, you started off talking about uh, Roe v. Wade construct, and of course uh, there are instances when uh, the state not answering my question. may have well, you get to ask it, you don't get to answer it, or you could, I suppose, um, which maybe you have chosen to suggest how you would like me to answer. But I believe that the primary concern of the state is that the individual has the right to control their reproductive destiny. 
and that happens to be the patient, and that is the woman. So do you think that the undue burden test is a qualitative analysis or a quantitative analysis? I think it's irrelevant. Thank you, Ms. Glick, for your indulgence. Um, Ms. Glick, you've um, indicated during the course of this debate that abortion is not a crime. Abortion is, what do you characterize it? A medical procedure. Is abortion ever a crime? Well, uh, currently there are some statutes which we seek to repeal that are, uh, there is a division between the justifiable abortion, and, which is an abortion that is performed on a woman with her consent, and then there are other statutes that relate to uh, different actions that would be taken against her as a person without her consent. We are repealing those. Is abortion ever a crime with consent? No. What if I were to tell you that... Uh, yes, I would, let me, let me just say, if it were to be performed by an unlicensed person, then that would be uh, an action that would not be lawful. Well, isn't it true that an abortion is also illegal if it is performed by a licensed individual who causes the death of the mother? Isn't that true? I'm not sure what circumstance uh, you are... Uh, well, in, I would be talking about criminally, criminally negligent homicide, for instance, and isn't it true that this act repeals even the criminally, criminally negligent homicide provision that would protect the mother in the, in, in the sense where, a, where an abortion were performed with consent by a licensed medical provider and the mother dies as a result of the gross negligence or criminal negligence of that licensed physician. Isn't it true that this bill does remove that provision? And if so, does that make women less healthy or more healthy? Well, you asked two questions. The first yes. question, the response to that, is that I believe that if somebody were acting in a criminally negligent fashion that there would be other uh, um, actions, criminal code, that could apply to that action uh, as far as would that make a woman more or less healthy if in fact, uh, I, so uh, obviously if the woman is, um, has been uh, killed as the result of negligence, obviously she is not more healthy. Okay, so those, those other crimes that you talk about, are they lesser offenses or greater offenses? Well, you know, I am not an attorney, and I know that you uh, would uh, like to argue uh, from that point. Uh, I look well, at we this... Well, we are members of the legislature, and we are talking about the law. <laughs> yes, Mr. Castorino. We are. Castorina. You say Castorina, <laughs> I say Castorino. <laughs> um, I don't... I believe that the laws of the state of New York would be adequate to hold a criminally negligent licensed professional uh, to account uh, perhaps to a greater extent. I suppose it depends on the evidence available uh, and the determination by the district attorney in the particular uh, jurisdiction and the facts of the case. Uh, as to whether or not a, um, someone would be uh, held to a greater penalty or not. Uh, but I believe that anybody uh, who is um, uh, 
killed by a criminally negligent act of a licensed professional will face uh, very serious criminal um, sanctions. Ms. Glick, although I appreciate your analysis, it's totally wrong as a matter of law. In fact, uh, pursuant to Penal Law 12505, 12520, 12540 through 60, and the Public Health Law, uh, law 4164, um, if a woman dies uh, in connection with an abortion that is on consent, uh, the penalty there, therefrom is a Class B felony. And this law would repeal that. So it's my proposition that uh, this would actually make women less safe because it allows now those under Title VIII to perform an abortion without a physician present and if done so in a negligent or grossly negligent way, they will not be subject to the homicide laws of the state of New York. Now, don't you believe that that is something that is less protective of women in the state of New York and not more? I do not believe that we repeal criminally negligent homicide. With respect to licensed professionals that perform abortion, that is most assuredly the so is assuredly the case in this statute. That is, this statute repeals every single, every single law affecting homicide in connection with abortion. And I believe that you Actually, know that. Actually, I believe you're wrong. You are wrong. It repeals in this. We do not repeal criminally negligent homicide. As I said before, the facts of the case, whether you are uh, killed as a result of criminally negligent behavior by a licensed professional who is either performing an abortion or an appendectomy, you could still be held responsible for criminally negligent homicide if the facts of the case were uh, such that the DA believed they could prove that case. I, I completely, I completely am in opposition to that statement. I do, do not believe that that is reflective of the law uh, that you are here proposing. And certainly I will allow everyone t the opportunity to take a look at that for themselves. But I want to move on to another issue. Last year, uh, you indicated that the reason for the need or the necessity to have these Title VIII professions uh, utilized for the purposes of abortion was because, and I quote, this is what you said in January 2017, you said in some instances because health care is not necessarily readily available and there are a few dozen counties, a few dozen counties in New York State where there is no abortion provider, dot, dot, dot. Do you still believe and conform with the opinion that in a few dozen counties in New York State that there is no abortion provider? I would just like you to clarify that for the record. I wish I had uh, the transcript of your comments. I, um, I have it right here, and I'm happy to provide it to you. I meant your comments during that debate. Uh, no, let no, me th th this is the full transcript. Would you like it? I can pass it over. No, that's fine. Uh, what I did say was that there were uh, and it is true that there are um, a number of counties. Um, we have 62 counties, uh, That's right. and um, having them reviewed by uh, their, whether it's Planned Parenthood or Guttmacher Institute, uh, there are uh, a couple of or a few dozen in which there is no provider who who specializes in abortion services. That is 100% true. Do what I did say, you know, it's easy to pull out one phrase. What I also said was that there are advanced practice clinicians who could provide greater access to health care. It is true that we have, in fact, looked to advanced practice clinicians to provide a range of services in communities where we have actually very few doctors. So we have nurse practitioners who are available in many of our rural Ms. communities Ms. Uh, Ms. where Glick. we do not have a physician available. Yes, Ms. Glick, I, 
I pulled that phrase out because it was quite important because you said that a few dozen counties, and you're right, we have 62 counties, and I think that a few is more than one, it's probably more than two, I would say a few is at least three, so then that would be at least 36 counties uh, without an abortion provider. But let me ask you a question. Um, what do you think about uh, NARAL, uh, the NARAL Pro-Choice Foundation? Do you, do you think that they're a reputable group on the issue of women's health and reproductive health care? I don't know what that particular question has to do well, let, let with me, the let me, substance yeah. of the bill. I, I can tell you. Um, and the reason is because NARAL Pro-Choice New York Foundation has a pamphlet out called Where to Get an Abortion, and it's every county in New York State, from Albany to Westchester, and every single county does in fact have an abortion provider who, by the way, happens to be a physician. So I would be happy to provide this to you so you can update your information and your records mm -hmm. for future debates. Thank you very much, Ms. Glick, for your time. I would like to go on the bill. On the bill, Mr. Castorino. Clearly, this statute does not follow the rule in Roe. It does not follow the rule in Casey. It does not follow the rule in Carhart. And it fails to follow the, un the undue burden test in Hellerstadt. This bill will make women less healthy. This bill will provide for people that are not physicians to be in the, posi in the position to perform an abortion on a woman with her consent, without a physician present, and in the event that a child is born alive, a child who is the, who the state has a legitimate interest in its potentiality as a citizen, the, the state's legitimate interests are not served by making sure that a physician is present to be there and tend to that life. This statute does not make women safe. This statute makes women less safe. And if you look at Roe and all of its progeny, and if you, if you synthesize the law, if you synthesize the rule, if you listen to the rhetoric, you will know, you will come to know that this statute does not protect women. In fact, it is very dangerous for women. And I am here as a member of the legislature to fight for women, to fight for women's rights, and I find this bill to be completely shocking, and it smacks in the face of all reason. The reality is that calling this the Reproductive Health Act is a misnomer. It is clearly political rhetoric, and women all over the state should know that the Reproductive Health Act is not an act that protects women. It is a political stunt. Thank you.